when you when you consider the great speakers that we have on our panel, the good news about beginning with me is that you know this thing is only going up from here, <laughs> right? A little, little known fact about Mark Dever is that when he was a kid, and I, I think I have the... If I get this wrong, you can tell me, Mark. When he was a kid and he would sit down at a dinner plate, he would always start with the food that you liked least and kind of save the best for last. So this morning he thought, let's start with the lima beans (laughs) and then we'll go from there. But let's open in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your love and mercy to us in Christ. We thank you for calling a people to yourself, saving a people to yourself, and that is the church. And we see this church throughout history. We see her in different parts of the globe today. We see her most concretely in each of our congregations, and we thank you for our own congregations. We pray that you would use this talk and the coming talks to be able to love those congregations more and better and that our love would abound in knowledge and depth of insight. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to start by messing with your categories a little bit, all right? So if we think about the different institutions that God has established on earth, we know we know he's, he's established the state, right? And the state has authority, has, has the power of the stor- sword. We know he's established families, and, and parents is having authority over the family. And you think of Proverbs talking about the parents having the power of the rod. We're good Protestants. We know the Bible has authority. And then we also have the church, And as good Protestants, we're not like those Roman Catholics that say the church so much has authority. We think of the church as being a voluntary society, right? So you choose to come, you choose to go. Uh, It's a voluntary thing. And so the question that we ask ourselves often when we approach a church for the first time in such a consumeristic society is, are the benefits good? What's the programming like? I, I like that preacher. He was kind of funny. But, but, but are there things for the kids? Not really sure. What are the do's here? And so we end up treating local churches and church membership a bit like you would treat Sam's Club or maybe it's Costco or, or a country club, whatever it is you have in your area. As for church discipline, well, that's no way, of course, to to win customers. And then thinking about if your job is the pastor, what what are you doing? You're you're trying to put on good programming to compete for customers, right? That's, that's, That's what you do. Well, friends, that's a little bit of our context. I think that's what we think of church membership as. We think of it as sort of club membership, um, voluntary society. But let's think about what the Bible says about what the church is and what church membership are. And to do that, I just want to think through the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to take seven points through the Gospel of Matthew. Point one, here it is. A question at stake in Matthew's Gospel is, who represents heaven on planet earth? A question at stake in Matthew's Gospel is, a main question I'd even say, is who represents heaven on planet earth? And what you find as you read through Matthew is it presents this fascinating dynamic between heaven and earth. And heaven, or the kingdom of heaven, is not so much referred in Matthew's gospel to that place you go when you die as it's talking about the domain of God's rule, where God rules. And earth represents, well, where sin rules, right? Let me, let me show you a few examples. I want you to flip through Matthew with me. Look at them with your own eyes. Chapter 3, let's start there. Chapter 3, verse 2. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay? So heaven's rule is is coming. You you better turn around. You better repent. Flip to chapter 5. Who are the the beneficiaries of of heaven's rule? Chapter 5, verse 3. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you've received heaven's rule, how, how is it that you live? Well, look at verse 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And then notice what the beneficiaries of heaven's rule desire and how it is that they pray. Look at chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom, he's talking to the Father in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, and then notice what such people strive after. Verse 19, do not store up your treasures on earth, but store up your treasure in heaven. And then flip to chapter 13, verse 11, and, and, and the remarkable privilege it is to represent heaven. Jesus saying to his disciples, chapter 13, verse 11, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, these people love the idea of kingdom of heaven. They, they don't hate it. Uh, flip to chapter 24. Because not, because not everybody loves it. Not everybody welcomes it. Chapter 24, verse 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Uh, flip to chapter 28. And who, who is this son of man? Well, verse 18. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven <clears throat> and on earth has been given to me. So I've given you just nine examples the word heaven shows up in Matthew's gospel 75 times, and heaven and earth appear together 12 times. This is a major theme in Matthew. You think of, you think of the garden where heaven were, walked with earth, right? And then chapter 3 of Genesis, heaven and earth are, are torn apart. And, and here in Matthew's gospel, you, you see the beginning of them coming together again. And here you have Christ saying, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. And earth, in the meantime, while still split, earth belongs to who? We'll go back to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, said to Jesus, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. The world belongs to the evil one. He is the prince of the power of the air. And this, of course, is why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? That's, that's the first theme that I want you to see in Matthew's gospel, that this, this dynamic between heaven and earth. And sitting on top of that theme is a second theme of regime, cha regime change. You know, like one presidential administration giving way to another presidential administration or, or, or uh, one regime, think Soviet Union, giving way to another completely regime, the Russian Republic, right? And what you have in Matthew's gospel is Jesus showing up and saying to the leaders of Israel, okay, gentlemen, you've, you've lost the election. Pack the contents of your desks. A security guard is going to escort you to the Capitol building doors. So a little more Bible flipping with me. Look at chapter 3, verse 9. Here's John the Baptist. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to, from these stones, to raise up children for Abraham. And then flip over to chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus talking this time. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west, outside of Israel, right? Many will come from the east and the west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Turn to chapter 23. Why, why are they going to be cast out? Why is Israel and its leaders, ethnic Israel and its leaders being cast out? Chapter 23, verse 13 
But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Your, your time is up, guys. Okay? So to sum up this sort of thematic survey in Matthew's gospel, we can say that Matthew's gospel is preoccupied with the question of who on earth represents heaven and, and, and what, their, what their lives are like. What's more, it answers that question by pointing to a once-in-history regime change. Okay? It, formerly, it was represented by ethnic Israel, and then it transfers to who? Before we get into that, I, I just want to meditate on this this, this theme, we are talking, think about this for, for a moment, friends. We are thinking about who on planet Earth represents the Father in heaven. I mean, isn't that what all people are searching for? Isn't that what people want to know? Who, who can I go to who speaks for God? Can you give me their names or something? Because I need to know who speaks for God. This, this is remarkable. This is, what we're, this is what all the philosophers are, are searching for. I mean, who, who, do I, who do I go to? Do, do I go to a priest, a pope, do, the Dalai Lama, a philosopher? Do, do I go to Kant or Hegel or, or Plato or Aristotle? Maybe I go to the literary types. Maybe I go to Homer or Shakespeare. Or... or Maybe I look inside of me. I find, I go for walks in nature, I enjoy the beauty of nature, and then I look inside of me and I find God's voice there. I find heaven's voice there. Is that what I do? Or maybe you're a little bit more cynical these days and you think, ah, what is truth? Who can really speak for heaven? I think more people think that today, right? Right? We are talking about a, a remarkable question here. Who on planet Earth is authorized to, is licensed to speak for heaven and heaven's rule? Okay, point one, the question at stake in Matthew's gospel is who on planet Earth represents heaven? Point two, point two, Jesus represents heaven. Chapter three, verse 17. Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son. So you have heaven affirming this one as looking like, acting like, taking on the work of the Father in heaven. So, uh, chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 27. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. That's chapter 11, verse 27. Okay, so, so Jesus, there on earth, Jesus represents heaven. Does anybody else? Well, keep, keep reading. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. That brings us to point three. Point three, the local church represents heaven. The local church represents heaven. Turn to Matthew 16. We're going to spend a little bit more time here in 16 and 18. In the first part of Matthew 16, we find Jesus warning the apostles not to trust Israel's leaders. Again, their, their term of office has expired. I'm going to be vacating Capitol building doors. And then Jesus asks, look there in verse 13, who, who do people say the Son of Man is? And then he asks again in verse 15, who do you say that I am? And so what we find here basically is that Jesus is interested in a what and in a who. What is a right confession, and who is a right confessor, right? So, so what are people saying, and what are you guys saying? And then Simon Peter, as you see there, answers probably on behalf of them all. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus affirms Peter's answer on behalf of heaven. He says, my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And, and then Jesus says this, verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so I'd say it appears as if Jesus is giving Peter the same authority as he himself just exercised, the, the authority to stand there on earth and to make declarations on behalf of heaven concerning this what and this who. No, notice he, he says he's going to build his church on this rock, this confessor, confessing the right confession. I'm adapting Ed Clowney's comment on the rock there. The confession cannot be separated from Peter, neither can Peter be separated from his confession. And then he gives Peter these keys, the, the, there's this symbol of authority for binding and loosing. So what is that all about? What is binding and loosing? Much debate over that, obviously. I think it's a rabbinic way of saying uh, they have the authority both to interpret the law, interpret the what of the law, as well as to make then declarations on the who of applying the law. So th think of the rabbi sitting around debating, okay, what, is, what does Moses say about divorce? When I wonder what circumstances can you, can, can a man pursue divorce? His wife's is she, you know, adulterous or just burns his toast? You know, different schools of thought on that. And then applying that, that, that what to the who. Okay, in light of what we say about the law, can, can, can this man or this woman pursue a divorce? So there, there, there's a declaration on both a what and a who. And what Jesus seems to be doing here is giving Peter and the apostles to make that sort of judgment on the what of the gospel and the who of the gospel. Is, is that a, the right confession of who he is? And are you a true confessor, right? So think about a judge, what a judge does for a moment. A judge does not make the law. A judge does not make a person innocent or guilty. A judge assesses the law, reads the law, tries to understand the law, and then apply that to a particular case, to a particular individual. Okay, so, so in Matthew 16, the apostles we see are, are said to hold the key, keys. Does anybody else, apostles are all gone now, does anybody else hold the keys? We'll turn to Matthew 18, where I would propose that Jesus puts the, hands of the key, puts the keys into the hands of the local church. Look at verses 15 and 16. There's this, this sinful dispute, or a man is confronted a couple of times over his sin, first by one, then a few more. He doesn't listen. Verse 17, then Jesus says, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Let, let me explain why you would remove that person from the covenant community. Uh, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, you plural here, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Uh, let me explain a little bit more. Verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I like Yahweh with the people of Israel, there I am among them. My, my authority is there among those two or three gathered in my name. They act on my behalf. Notice there's no mention of elders or, or, or bishops or pastors in these verses. It's just these two or three gathered in his name to act on his behalf. The local church, friends, appears to have Heaven's authority to guard the who, or the what, and the who of the gospel. Who and what on earth represents heaven. It holds the keys. Jesus has authorized your local assemblies <clears throat> to stand in front of confessors, to consider their confessions, and to make a judge-like pronouncement, yes, that's the true gospel. Y you got it. And yes, you, you, you appear to be a true gospel confessor. It's, it's just like Jesus did with Peter, right? Who, who do you say I am? That's right, the Father in heaven told you that. 
And the church does this with the ordinances, which are established in Matthew 26 and Matthew 28, Lord's Supper and Baptism. We're baptized into his name. Who, who are the two or three gathered in his name? Well, it's, it's those baptized into his name. Um, so friends, I, I, I want to make sure you understand this. The, the local church has heaven's authority, key holding authority, to publicly declare before the nations who belongs to Christ, who is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And it does this through bringing people into membership as signified in baptism and the Lord's Supper. The church does not have authority to make Christians. It has the authority to declare Christians. It's just like my visit to the U.S. Embassy in Brussels, Belgium, when I was, I was studying abroad and my passport expired. I went down to the U.S. Embassy there in Brussels, handed it to them. They kind of looked in their computers. They said, yes, you're a, you're a U.S. citizen. They, they printed out a new passport, handed it back, and I was able to leave. Formally declared a U.S. citizen. Now, did the embassy make me a U.S. citizen on that day? Well, no, I, I was already a citizen. But they had an authority that I, as an individual U.S. citizen, do not have to formally declare that, as it were, before the nations of the earth. Friends, what the local church is then, in that regard, it's an embassy. It's an embassy of the kingdom of God. It's an embassy representing... Not a kingdom from across geographic space, right? U.S. being represented over there in Belgium. But an embassy representing a movement across eschatological time. The end of history has come forward to that assembly. And they, they represent this heavenly and end time assim, uh, 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 kingdom. Now, as it declares on the what and the who of the gospel. Do you see? So I, I love driving down Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., where outside what you see is, you know, the nations get, get all these embassies lined up, and you see the, the flags of the embassies flying out front, and, and you think to yourself inside, what's, what's the diplomatic business of, of that nation going on behind the closed doors? And if you, if you go to the, the, say, the embassy dinners, not that I ever have, but if you go to the embassy dinners of those, of those buildings, I, I trust you would have a taste of their culture. What is the local church? The local church is where the flag of the kingdom of heaven flies through, through baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's where uh, the people of heaven gather. It's where the diplomatic business and the strategies and the scheming of the kingdom of heaven gets conducted. It's where the culture of heaven begins to be felt, experienced in our lives together. So what is the local church? It's not just a building. It's, it's not where you go once a week to get your spiritual jolt it's the people of God on earth. It's the people of heaven on earth. This is not Sam's club. This is not a country club. Friends, think with me about how remarkable this is. This means that Brother Bob and Sister Sue and Deacon Darnell down at Bumble Stew Baptist have more authority than the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Supreme Court, the United Nations, the philosophy departments of the Ivy League universities, the New York Times editorial page, the, the, those three down at Bumblestoon Baptist have more authority than all of those institutions to say, truth of God is here. People of God are here. Amen. Do you praise God for the local church? Or do you complain about it? gripe about it? Or do you marvel at the fact that God would choose the foolish things like you and me and our friends to shame the wise and to speak for himself? 
The local church is God's embassy on planet Earth, an embassy filled with citizens of Christ's kingdom. A couple of implications follow. Here's the first. Point four. First implication, point four. We don't join churches. We submit to them. You can use the language of join. That's fine. I'm just thinking theologically, thinking biblically. What, what is my relationship to a church? I'm, I am submitting to it. I don't submit to a club. But I submit to a church. It's an act of citizenship, and Christians must join churches. It's a voluntary society from the state standpoint, yes. It's a voluntary society insofar as I get to choose which church I want to join, yes. But from the standpoint of Christ's kingdom, it is not a voluntary society because I am called by Christ, the King, to be submitted to a local church. I, I don't just read my Bible and decide, you know, I think I'm a Christian. I think I believe this and then have license to stand before the nations and say, oh, nations of the earth, let me baptize myself and now I represent Jesus. I do not have, as an individual Christian, I do not have the authority to do that. Rather, well, think of how Peter responds in Acts chapter 2. What must we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized. Show yourself to the church there in Jerusalem and let them affirm your profession of faith. Let them give you the, the Christian credentials, Right? And then verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Add, added to what? Well, added to those who number themselves as members of the church in Jerusalem. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure they didn't have an Olin Mills directory. <laughs> but they had something. They had something to say, this is our number. 3,000 are being added to this number. And notice, this is a mega church. And it only gets bigger in subsequent chapters. And they, they're practicing, they have some sense of who they are. Right? They, they, I saw a list of names, I, I don't know what it was. Something like that. So what is church membership then? If it's an embassy, what is, what is church membership? Well, it's, it's a declaration of citizenship in Christ's kingdom. It's a passport. It's, it's an announcement made in the press room of Christ's kingdom that you are an official, licensed, bona fide, card-carrying Jesus representative. Uh, let, me, let me give you a one-sentence definition without all the metaphors. Church membership is a relationship between, between a church and a Christian in which the church affirms and oversees a Christian's profession of faith and discipleship, and, and the Christian submits to that church's affirmation and oversight. Okay, asymmetrical relationship. One is, think of the verbs, one is affirming and overseeing, and the other is submitting. And it's that relationship that constitutes what we understand to be church membership. And, and it does this through these wordless oaths that we refer to as baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, evangelicals, to be sure, view their friends and <clears throat> pastors and churches as aids to personal growth and discipleship. Nothing new there, but the, the, there's a difference, I'm contesting to you, there's a difference between pragmatic aids from which one picks and chooses, and an authority structure which binds and looses. And, and that difference between those two things is nothing more or less than the local church. The local church is not just a people, it's a people inside of an authority and accountability structure. And friends, that's the difference between my relationship with all of you in this room and my relationship with the other members of my own local church. So we all, by God's grace, though all of us who are believers, share in, in a kind of fellowship, a fellowship of you know, love, faith. Whereas with the members of my own local church, I share in a disciplined fellowship. Okay, an accountability fellowship. 
Furthermore, it's inside of this accountability fellowship, this discipline fellowship that each of us should look to first and foremost to, to build our spiritual lives. It's, it's the people who I'm getting to know and they're getting to know me who are able with love and integrity to affirm my profession of faith as a valid one and to oversee my profession of faith as I say, with integrity. You don't want to separate authority structures with relational knowledge, right? You want to keep those two things together. And that's why in the ordinary course of things, I want my primary Christian relationships to be with those who are inside of the same local church as me. Uh, so very practically, what that means is that when I'm considering what home to buy, for instance, or what apartment to rent, I'm going to try to live very close to other members of my church so that throughout the week, throughout the seven days of the week, we're able to integrate our lives with one another so I, that I can say, hey, I'm at the store. Do you need anything? Happy to pick it up for you on the way home or, hey, you, you, you've been working like crazy. Why don't you and your wife go out and, and, and just drop the kids off at our house and, and we can watch over them so you and your, you and your wife can get a date? Or, or can we meet weekly? I'm just really struggling to read my Bible and grow in the faith. I just find a lot of complacency. Can, can we get, you just live a couple doors down from me. Can, can we get together weekly? Or how can we partner together to like, evangelize our neighborhood and put on, say, more barbecues in the summer. Let's, let's share that load, put on these barbecues for people in our neighborhood, right? So when we submit, what, what I'm trying to say here is when we, we submit our lives to the accountability structure of the local congregation, it's really more than that, isn't it? You're, you're, you're submitting your whole life. You're submitting your friendships and your affections and your geography, in a sense, and your money, and your prayer, and your spiritual growth, and your discipleship to this assembly of people. Now, am I just making this up? Well, remember what I just read in Acts 2? Repent and be baptized. They were added to their numbers. And then, then we read this. Verse 43, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And verse 44, and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing it proceeds to all as any had need. And, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They've submitted themselves to the church and then they're living together. You see authority and life together, relational knowledge to, to, together, working together. So, so think with me for a moment how, how this works in, in daily life, right? How we put these two things together. So it's, it's, two, it's Tuesday evening. I'm sitting there at the dinner table with a couple of young brothers who I'm trying to disciple. And both of these young brothers come from homes where, let's just say, their fathers weren't faithful fathers, what I'm doing for these two young men as I interact with my wife and interact with my children is I'm defining for them. I'm giving them a category for what a Christian father and a Christian husband is because I'm a baptized member of a church that we are all members of together. So let's suppose for a second that I am an abusive father or an abusive husband. Well, the lesson I'm transmitting at that point to these two young brothers is that a Christian father and a Christian husband can be abusive. That is, until the church steps in and says, we, we want our Jesus name tag back, please which would then clarify for these two brothers, the gospel isn't about that. The gospel is not about abusive men. The gospel is about something different. Notice then that the institutional church and the organic church can't be so easily 
separated, as, as theologians sometimes say. After all, it's our membership in a local church as signified through baptism and the Lord's Supper. It's our membership that makes our whole week speak about Jesus. You see? So you don't, you don't leave the institutional church on the way out the door. You don't leave the, the, on, on the steps on the way out the door. You don't leave the institutional church and go be the organic church throughout the week. Uh, rather, it's, it's all week that the church has declared you to be an ambassador for Christ. And you own that name, Christian. So right now I'm having a conversation with a guy. Actually, that's not quite true. A little while back, I was having a conversation with a guy who has been attending our church for a number of years, and he's very astute theologically, and so there's different little problems in our statement of faith that he has, he has quibbles about. And so we got together for one lunch, and I said, well, let's, let's talk through that issue. And we, we worked through it. And I said, you ready to join? And he said, well, no, I have this other, this other problem with the statement of faith. So we got together for another lunch. We worked through that one. Still wouldn't join. At one point I asked him, so what was the, the church you were the member of last? And he said, well, I, I attended this church for a few years, but I never really joined because I had a problem with this. Okay, what about before that? Well, I attended this church for, for a number of years, but I never joined them because of this. Okay, I see a pattern here. I don't think this is a church problem right? And so finally one day I just said to the brother, look, I think you should stop taking the Lord's Supper. That's not an act of excommunication. I don't have the authority. It's just one of the, one of the elders of this church to do that. I'm just telling you pastorally, I think you should stop taking the Lord's Supper because you're a free agent. You're the captain of your own ship. How do you know that you're not living in a deceived sort of way about who you are and who you represent? And interestingly, he was astute enough theologically to say, actually, I already have. I've, I've not taken it for a number of years. That's very sad. In general, friends, I, I would say a person should stop calling themselves publicly a Christian if they're not in submission to the authority of a local congregation. You're living in unrepentant sin. Okay, I said there's a couple of implications of the fact that the church is an embassy. Implication one, I said, is that you're to submit to a, a local church. Implication two, and here's point five. Church membership is an office. It's a job. So it's like when you, when you, when you walk into the embassy to, to, to get your passport removed, uh, uh, affirmed, and they, you know, give you a new passport. At that point, you walk around the desk and now you're standing at the desk working on behalf of the embassy. And that office you have as a church membership comes with, let's just say, four different descriptions or four different responsibilities. Job responsibility number one, help preserve the gospel. Help preserve the gospel. So to everyone joining your church, you should say, friend, as, as a member of this church, we're, we're trusting on you, we're relying on you. In fact, Jesus has authorized you to help preserve the gospel witness in this particular place. So think about Paul's astonishment in Galatians 1. I'm astonished that you are so quickly turning to a different gospel. Yeah, he goes on, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. He, he's astonished because the members of the Galatian churches aren't doing what they had been assigned, what their job was to do, which was to affirm and protect the, the right who, or I'm sorry, the right what of the gospel in that place by, by taking great care with who the teachers are in that place. And so he doesn't upbraid the elders, he upbraids the, the congregations themselves for, for listening to this false gospel. So a question for you pastors is, have you been teaching the members of your church the gospel so well that they would recognize departures from it? Either if those departures come out of your mouth or if those departures come out and they go off to some other church, they, they would say, that's, that's not right. 
Uh, have you taught the members of, this church, of your church that this is their job? Have you, have you equipped them? Have you catechized them in the gospel to, to, to know the gospel? So it's not just your work to guard the gospel, though it is certainly that, and to lead them, but for them to know the gospel so well that they will not tolerate false gospels. Now, that's, that's a healthy church. That, that's a church, I think, that's going to endure over years, over decades, over generations, because, man, they're equipped to, to, to sniff out false gospels and false, false gospel teachers when they hear them. Uh, job responsibility number two, help affirm gospel citizens. So, again, what are you saying to the people joining your church? You're saying, hey, as a member of this church, we, we, we are trusting you in fact, Jesus has delegated you, he has authorized you to help us affirm who the citizens of heaven are in, in this place. And, and again, I think this is the job that we see being take, undertaken by the members of the New Testament churches in, in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 5, look there. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul doesn't address the elders, he addresses the church itself. Look at verse 5. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Okay, that, that's the action to be taken. You are to, to hand him over. No longer a member of the kingdom of heaven, but a, a member of the kingdom of, of Satan, as it were. Now look at verse 4, and tell me what the four conditions are for when that action is to be taken. Do you see them? Four conditions? When you are assembled, okay, this, this isn't going on behind closed door in the elders meeting, when, when, you, when you're assembled, in the name of Jesus, what does that remind you of? Matthew 18, wherever two or three are gathered in my name. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit, my apostolic spirit is present, right? With the power of the Lord Jesus. Jesus' power and authority represented there in that, that assembly of people baptized into his name. Okay, in those circumstances, hand this man over to Satan. Is, is Paul saying, well, maybe the elders should just announce it in the assembly? Well, we'll look at verse 12. Is it not those inside the church, Corinthians, whom you are to judge? Incidentally, there, there's an attestation of my reading of the keys. It's an act of judgment. So what, what does that mean, brothers? It means don't fire your church members from the job that Jesus assigned to them in receiving and dismissing members. Instead, your job is to equip them to recognize the gospel, the what of the gospel so well, and how that should play out in people's lives, and whether or not these lives are in conformity with the gospel, with all its ethical implications, and I'm, I'm getting to know these people because I'm living together with them. I, I know I'm only one of a hundred people here, but I, I'm responsible for all of them, so I, I need to get to know them so that I can exercise my gospel responsibility carefully with love and integrity, right? Think, think of two exercise classes. Exercise class number one, you got the instructor with his jump rope and barbells, people sitting in lawn chairs watching. Exercise class number two, jump rope, barbells, here's how you do it. Now only put it in your hands class. Now I'm gonna walk around and I wanna watch you do it. Lift those weights, jump that rope. Which of these two exercise classes is going to be a stronger, healthier class? So we're equipping as elders. We're called to equip the saints for doing this guarding the gospel what and guarding the gospel who. That is our job. Job responsibilities number three and four. Disciple other church members and evangelize non-Christians. So if, if just very briefly, if, if membership in the ordinances make our whole week speak about Jesus, every member of your church needs to realize that they are a name tag Jesus wearing Jesus ambassador, whether they like it or not. And by making them members of the church, we have commissioned them publicly to be those ambassadors. And so it's our job to equip them for that. Point number 
How long have I been going, Mark? Seriously. Point number six. What's that? All right. Number six, we must take great care to keep the line between church and world clear. We must take great care to keep the line between church and world clear. Remember, these are embassies of heaven. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? I'll make my dwelling among them and walk among them. Remember God, Adam and Eve, garden, walking with them, heaven on earth? And then Israel pointing towards, typologically pointing towards, and Paul saying, hey, this is pointing to what happens with the, with the church. I will walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go, for, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. All those Levitical laws, right? Pointing towards the people of God in the New Testament, the church to, to, to be separate. And so, friends, very practically, this means why church leaders need to be think very carefully about these prudential consideration like membership classes and membership interviews and, and, and how you go through these membership programs and, and, and so forth. Um, are there membership interviews in the Bible? Well, Jesus says to Peter, who do you say that I am? There's your first membership interview. <laughs> right? You got the answer right. Are you asking people who join the church, can you, can you help me understand the gospel, explain the gospel? Or 1 John chapter 4, John says, test the spirits. Not every spirit will say Jesus comes from God. Do people joining your church understand the doctrine of the incarnation? You know, and are you explaining to them, whether through membership classes or long walks or whatever it is in your context, are you explaining to them what it means to be a member of this church and what you expect of them and what you require of them, right? These are some of the things that we want to do to have this conversation about being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And I think, honestly, we could go through different areas of the church's life and think through what, what it means to keep this line clear. So there's going to be implications for your music ministry and who you have up on, on stage or wherever. Do you want those to be non-Christians representing the kingdom of heaven? This is going to have implications for church discipline. You're going to want to practice discipline. This is going to have implications for your counseling ministry. Right? So who do you want the members of your church primarily? There'll be time, I would say, time for perhaps specialists. But on the whole, who do you want the members of your church being counseled by? Well, presumably it's, it's other citizens of the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's others who are within the same accountability structure and will give an account to God for the way they counsel one another. I think this has, let's just think for a moment what the implications might be for a children's ministry or a youth ministry. I think that the temptation of a lot of youth ministry is to sloppify that line between church and world. So, you know, you got a bunch of church kids. Some of them are Christians. Some of them are not. Then you got these unchurched kids. I mean, who's to say, really, this is, this is a tough age. Some of them claim to be Christians. Some of them, some don't. Well, what I would say, brothers and sisters, is, is whatever you do programmatically, Make sure that your words and programs and methods are helping those youth to understand that there is this line between the church and the world. And the most important thing they can do is, is, is be on the right side of that line. So you're not building up your youth ministry or your, your children's ministry as this kind of separate wing of the church where all the rules and expectations and job responsibilities of being a Christian, being a church member, somehow don't apply. And so if you are going to baptize your adolescents, you are going to baptize your youth, and that's another conversation worth having, make sure that you're bringing kids into the full membership of the church where they're under the oversight of the elders, where they're under the oversight of the whole congregation, where they're, they're being asked and expected to carry out this, this job description that Jesus intends for every citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It's not like citizenship in the U.S. where, you know, you have kids who don't have, they're not 16 yet, you don't quite give them all the responsibilities of 
of membership because, well, they're not old enough. It's not like that. This isn't an into birth citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is people who are professing and believing and saying, yes, that's Jesus. That's the gospel. I'm wearing that name. I'm taking responsibility for him. So before you entrust those responsibilities, before you affirm somebody, before the nations as, as wearing that name tag, they should be able to carry out the obligations of citizenship, the, the, the jobs of church membership. Okay, last point, point seven. Church membership is for repentant and baptized sinners. Church membership is for repentant and baptized sinners. Okay, so Israel and the leaders of Israel were evicted from office because they were disobedient and shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Does that mean, Jonathan, are you saying that I got to be really good to be a member of the church? Got to be really righteous. Okay, last, last bit of Bible flipping, brothers and sisters. Little, last, last bit here. Chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Chapter 10, verse 32. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Chapter 18, verse 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so th these, these are the people whom the church is to receive. The poor in spirit, those who repent and do the Father's will, those who acknowledge Christ and those who humble themselves like little children. Please, please Daddy, lead me. So, so do you see the, the pattern there? Christianity and therefore church membership is not for the strong. It's not for the people who have their acts together. It is for those who are determined to follow their own wills, to do it their way, who have tried and then failed. Christianity and therefore church membership is for those call, uh, high school students who, who professed faith and then went off to college and they squandered their moral ideals and feel sick about it. Christianity and church membership is for the young mom who's read all the books on being a mom and she's determined to be this really good mom who does all of these things and then the kids are driving her crazy and she shouts at them and she feels sick about that. Christianity and therefore church membership is for the man who spent his entire life you know climbing up the ladder doing good uh, making a lot of money getting into a good position gets to the end looks back and realizes that was all about me. I've estranged my family, my friends, and I've made a lot of money, and it was all about me. In other words, Christianity and therefore church membership is not for the morally perfect. It is for the morally broken. God, in his remarkable wisdom, has determined to use these, these foolish ones, to represent him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 12. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. For I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. He, he's come not to call the people who are doing really well, but he, he, he's come to call uh, the one who, who recognizes that he or she is a sinner, who hates that fact, and who turns and puts his or her trust in Christ. Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And friends, this, this is the heart of Christianity, right? I, I, I love that picture of the woman who's been bleeding for 30 years, and she spent all that she has on doctors, and she thinks to herself, if I just reach out and I touch his garment, right? 
I know how sinful and wretched I am if I just, if I just reach out and grab his garment. I will be made righteous. That's, that's who church membership is for. What does baptism into church membership mean? It's a press release to the nations. Attention all nations. We, Bumble Stew Baptist Church, formally recognize this individual as an adopted son of the Heavenly Father, a forgiven co-heir with Christ, and a recipient of the Spirit, and bearing the name of all three. Do you want to know, O nations of the earth, what God is like? Look here. That's your church, friends. Shall we pray and thank Him for it? Father, we give you praise that you would forgive sinners like us. And we marvel that you would give authority to us to declare who your people are. Help us to, to be good stewards of that authority, to take care with that authority. That we might love your church well, that we might love your name and reputation on earth well. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.